Well, in today's trial, I am the prosecuting attorney. I am the angel of vengeance. Uh, or the protector of the people of the great state of whatever state we've set the trial in this time. So we're trying to prove that the defendant murdered his uh, ex-girlfriend with premeditation and intent, which would make it first degree murder, the highest form of murder. The defense is arguing that he has brain problems that show up on his brain scan and they would like to have the jury see a brain scan and see how abnormal and strange this man's brain is and use that to argue that he could not have had the intent and the, the, the premeditation that's necessary to convict him of first degree murder. Um, we will argue that there's no way you can tell that from a brain scan. That if you look at most of our brains you'll find some very funky things and most of us are not murderers, uh, and many murderers don't have odd things in their brains. So I'm the expert witness for the defense. So I'm gonna be arguing that uh, the brain lesion may help explain a person's uh, actions. It really is all gonna be focused on structural MRI, none of the other fancy functional MRI or diffusion tensor imaging, just a use of the MRI machine to look at the structure of the brain and the anatomy of the brain. And what we hope to show is that the brain lesion that the a pretend defendant has might have helped explain why he did what he did. And there have been many association studies between local lesions and uh, severe impulsivity, including things like frontotemporal dementia, where a patient may have degeneration of the frontal cortex and uh, become extremely impulsive. So impulsive, in fact, that they may try to get out of a moving car if they see something that they uh, that they are um, uh, that they want to get. Uh, or if they, uh, if they have something in front of them, they might immediately use that item even though they don't need it. So for example, a person may have a, be presented with a set of eyeglasses and they'll put it right on their face even if they don't wear eyeglasses. So those kind of associations between uh, the lesion and the uh, behavior have been made. The trial really has two parts as we've set up this mock version. And it is important to remember that this is very, very different from what would happen in a real trial. It's much shorter and much less tedious, we hope. Uh, one part is the argument over whether the evidence should be allowed in at all, whether it meets the standards to, required to admit scientific evidence. And then the second part, after the judge rules against me on the first part, which I've ultimately become resigned to because if he ruled for me, there would be no second part, uh, and the second part, the evidence is admitted and we then argue as to what it means and how the jury should interpret it. It's a, a new frontier of, of what's going on in the, in the uh, courts. We're seeing a lot of things where uh, a person who was in a civil trial, for example, might say, well, these guys damaged my brain, and then here's the images that show the actual damage that happened. One of the things where people use this on the edge or fringe might be saying, well, this person had traumatic brain injury, which in a lot of ways is kind of a silent, uh, not a very visible image, on the, you know, it doesn't create a real clear structural lesion. And yet they're saying, well, that I can show based on the MRI that there was enough damage to suggest that they did this to this client. In a criminal case, it's a little bit different. Sometimes it might be used to uh, mitigate the person's uh, sentence to say, hey, this guy, yes, he did some awful, egregious things, uh, but now in the sentencing phase, let's show that there are some reasons why he might have been at a disadvantage and look at his brain and look at what he's dealt with through his life and say, maybe he shouldn't deserve the death penalty because his brain is actually not like the rest of ours. Well, I think that they need to be aware that these things are making it into the courts, regardless of whether we say this should happen or shouldn't happen. It actually is part of our legal system, and I see uh, that as an interesting, uh, you know, definitely something that is up for debate and discussion. Uh, we shouldn't just let these things happen without actually having thought about it, and that's what we're trying to do here is educate them and say, this is happening, what do you think, and is it okay? Uh, Definitely educating the judicial folks about it, and the, even judges sometimes come to these things and, and they, because they need to be aware of so many different things to make such important decisions. So that's uh, one of the things is that, you know, you will see MRI in the courtroom and, what, you know, you should be educated to know so that you don't get snowed by the experts. <laughs>
So that's, that's the nice thing about having two sides of it. So I'll have my side where I'll be arguing that yes, a brain lesion as seen in these MRIs can influence behavior. And another individual will say, well, yeah, but it's not 100% clear. You can't say always that a brain lesion is going to influence behavior. Is it possible that someone with frontal lobe damage would not exhibit the sorts of symptoms that you've testified to? Yes, it's possible. Do you have any knowledge whether the defendant, Mr. Johnson, uh, jumped out of a moving car? I have no evidence. Or put that. two sets of glasses on? Uh, no. So it could be that someone with frontal lobe damage would show these symptoms, correct? Yes. It could also be that someone with frontal lobe damage would not show these symptoms. That's correct. It's possible that somebody without frontal lobe damage could show these symptoms as well. That's correct. This bears watching. That neuroscience is advancing at incredible speed that the law cares about brains. and right? The law doesn't care, actually care that much about bodies. It cares much more about why we do things and how we do things and how conscious we were when we did things. So neuroscience will affect the law because the law cares so much about human behavior and neuroscience will tell us more about that. But that it's early days and these things are complicated. So I think it's something people should know about keep an eye on, and not rush to judgment either for it or against it. We have lots of hard work to be done before we know how it's really going to turn out.